Okay, towards the end of these interviews, I like to do a lightning round where I list a series of people or ideas and have my guests respond to each item in one minute or less. Are you down? Hey there, everyone. It's Joel Williamson from the non Servian Podcast. I wanted to experiment with an episode that's a little unorthodox this time around. I've received such positive feedback about the lightning rounds that I do with each of my guests, so I figured I'd compile all the ones from 2019 and put them together for you in one episode. I want to thank everyone for continuing to listen and support the show. I hope you enjoyed this episode. There's no better place to start this off than with the first interview I did with Jason the Radlib Bias. Benjamin Tucker. Uh, I think Benjamin Tucker is a really fascinating thinker. His uh, Sternerism does not seem like real Sternerism to me, but kind of an interesting like anarchistic contractarianism. I think it would be really interesting for someone to write something really kind of fleshing out, trying to figure out what the logical structure of that is. I think also uh, he's some someone who I think he was wrong about a lot of things, but the ways in which he's wrong are even interesting. I think a lot of the ways in which that are distinctive of him compared to a lot of modern libertarians, I think if nothing else, the direction he's trying to go with, even the things that he's wrong about are better. Um, and I wish he had not been as combative with a lot of people he engaged with, but he's certainly a fun writer when he is being combative. Quakerism. Yeah, so Quakerism is really fascinating to me for a lot of reasons, one of which is the development of Quakerism early on. It was around the same time as things like the Levelers were getting off the ground, and you notice that um, the Levelers, who I think are, are really influential to me, especially on kind of recovering this kind of radical liberal ethos, you notice that a lot of the Levelers are people who they started out and they were like Calvinists, and then they became Quakers. That's, I think, the first thing that made me interested in Quakers is like, wow, that's interesting. I wonder if there's some relationship there. Quakerism does seem to me to be, I think, a particularly amenable religious framework for kind of radical liberal thought. Its emphasis on individualism, a lot of them would not like me to put it that way, but individualism, especially the elevation of the individual understanding of right and wrong, the inner light. Uh, not just under, I guess not understanding, but the sense of what is the right thing to do, which they see as the direct communication of the Holy Spirit. And I think because of, I have reasons because of the intuitionism that we talked about earlier of thinking that this is very good, whether or not it's true as in the theological terms, I think there's something there. And I think there's something to the fact that Quakers were a lot earlier than everyone else on being strong abolitionists of slavery and other sorts of social ills. And also, really quickly, because I know that it's going over a minute, but um, <laughs> their method of decision making, I think, is a really fascinating. It's not consensus, even though it looks like consensus, but it's kind of like a morally charged semi consensus of everyone believing that they're that they're trying to collectively understand the will, the the inner light, the the direct working of the Holy Spirit. But I think it provides a really interesting model for decision making in kind of small groups. Trump. I, w I would like to say I don't think about him <laughs> to quote Rourke on that. But uh, unfortunately, I do think about him. <laughs> and um, I guess I don't really have a lot to say other than that he just startling to me even independent of his politics how good an exemplar he is of moral vice he really seems to be someone who is not ever trying to work out a mutually beneficial exchange somebody who's always trying looking at things as interpersonal conflict and trying to win those conflicts and i think seeing how badly of a life that it would be to live as Donald Trump, I think, no matter what material benefits he gets, is itself, I think, a really powerful moral argument. So, yeah. yeah. Nationalism. So I think we kind of touched on a little bit this when we were talking about the all right, but yeah. uh, I think uh, nationalism is a really destructive force. So I think, so I guess one thing we didn't talk about is other kinds of things that call themselves nationalism. 
so things that are not like uh, th things that are like oppressed groups kind of nationalism or like territories under the control of someone else kind of nationalism so you might think like Welsh nationalism or something like that as opposed to British nationalism so I think that those kinds of nationalisms are kind of a fusion of two things, which is one, a good thing, which is kind of just this tendency towards decentralism, uh, secession, opposition to colonialism or ongoing imperial rule. That's all good. But I think that it often gets wedded to this kind of identitarian collectivism that I think is gravely problematic. And even if it's not that problematic in a particular instantiation at the moment, I think that it's the sort of thing that is the seeds of something that could become very problematic when it really got off the ground. So once once you have have the new territory, let's say that you you win your your nationalist struggle, then that identity group is the that is the power group in this new nation. I think that's the seeds of a problem. Wittgenstein. One of the things that's interesting about him to me is that he'll often write in such a way, as I'm thinking of his later work, which is really all I care about, honestly, but he'll often write in such a way where uh, he kind of gives an argument that gives you a fork, where you could take this argument in one direction, or you could take it in another direction. But he doesn't actually say which direction he's taking it. And so that's led to a lot of radically different interpretations of Wittgenstein. So some people think that he's a highly skeptical philosopher, I think that is very much not the case. I think he was much more of an anti-skeptical philosopher than probably he himself even realized. Here's the second lightning round with none other than Clay Baby Zobelak. The Spanish Anarchist Revolution. Uh, you know, it's hard to object to anything that George Orwell was really into, right? I'm a big fan of Orwell and uh, he loved it. It was a good attempt and it was a it was a big failure in, in both the ways that people usually tell anarchists they're going to fail. That is, they will be destroyed by an outside aggressor, which Spanish anarchism largely was by the Soviet Union and then, and then Franco's fascists. It was a great attempt and it was a great thing for inspiration, but it was, it was nothing like what I'm interested in. There were certain ideals which were great in terms of like fraternity and liberation from clergy and the state and maybe capitalism, but it, it falls far short of what I'm interested in. There's not much distinct that distinguishes it from like a Marxist revolution, except an attempt to give workers more say and give workers more pleasure and more meaning. And that's a good thing, but it's not necessarily what I'm interested in. I, I am interested in those things, but only in so far as people are happy. And you can democratize a factory, but the factory remains. <laughs> you know, yeah, and that may not be ideal. That's 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 a bizarre. It's a shitty thing to say because you're basically saying like, Ugh, was it? You know, I mean, they were doing the best they fucking could. Yeah, yeah. And it was great in a lot of ways. And if you read Orwell's descriptions of what it was like in Catalonia at the height of it, he, he was, you know, it blew his mind and it blew my mind to read about it. I couldn't. It sounds incredible. Mm -hmm. um, but there were a lot of nasty stuff about it. It's not ideal, but it was a good attempt. Yeah. Yeah. Good on them. <laughs> Curtis Stan. A good attempt. You know, um, I think <laughs> if you talk to Hakanto and Jacob and Megan about this, you might get different levels of like enthusiasm about it. I'm really excited about it. Um, and by Kurdistan, I think you know we're talking about like the PKK and Rojava and yeah. that kind of stuff, as opposed to like Iraqi Kurdistan, mm -hmm. which is not necessarily libertarian. Right. There's, if someone says that is not an anarchist project, what they're saying makes sense. In a lot of ways, it's it's not. It doesn't fulfill like individual anarchist or, or like libertine desires and hopes. Like you know, it's not like Cicero and people are like would be happy with the place, or Sterner would be happy with it necessarily. I think, but it certainly is an it's an improvement upon like what seems like feudal patriarchal brutality of the space, right? Like it. Certainly Rojava is, is preferable to like Syrian state control or Turkish state control or Islamic state control. Um, the main issue here is I don't want to deny it as an anarchist project because I don't think there's a real clear understanding of what anarchy might be because there's no good clear understanding of what freedom is and there's no good understanding of what equality is. 
And so these things are only meaningful in a context of individuals and uh, you know, socially dependent people. And if they feel that they are freer, and if they feel they're more equal in ways that they like, you can't deny that it's like a, a good anarchist project. So I mean, yeah, my, my judgment is simply that like I'm horrified that Turkey may destroy it. Like I, that's the last thing I want. Like if anything, I, I just want it to flourish and be successful and be amazing and be able to visit. But it doesn't necessarily reflect what I would like to live in. But I am excited to see people maybe trying to make what a situation they think is more free and more equal. And in that sense, it is an anarchist project. But in other senses, it's not. Right? It's not necessarily pluralistic. And a lot of people will say it is, and people disagree with me, and I don't know a lot about it, but it seems better than nothing. It's not perfect, and it's, it's, it's kind of nasty in some ways, but it seems kind of beautiful in a lot of ways. So, you know, I'm for it. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson. You know, by our standards today, he's, he's a monstrous hypocrite, but thank God he existed. You know, it's, it's a tremendous stroke of luck that he had something to do with the creation of the, the current state, that he had such a bizarre set of beliefs in terms of freedom from religion and the freedom of religion and distribution of power. In terms of our own morals today, he's a monster, but in terms of the, the morals and the ethics and the norms of the time, he was a, a rabid anarchist, basically. He was a racist and he was a slave owner and he was a hypocrite and he was he was a hedonist in such a way that really damaged his life and damaged his legacy but some of his beliefs are like fundamental to my personal interests and personal beliefs like a kind of distributed agrarian society of like equals interacting on a local level to blah 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 blah, blah. there is no coherent united states or even modernity without jefferson's influence and i think american anarchism is meaningless without reference to Jefferson, despite his like, you know, terrible failures. You can maybe say more negative things about him in terms of what we prioritize today, but American anarchism is, 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 is he's one of the founding fathers of it, right? Like Benjamin Tucker called himself an unterrified Jeffersonian. Mm -hmm. And I would say in many ways, I can't deny that I myself am a Jeffersonian. It's not a kind of social, Jeffersonian or something like that. All you can say about him is he's indispensable to our current condition and our current trajectory, especially in like Anglo-American utopianism. His legacy is so seductive <laughs> that there's good reason to both, to both embrace his legacy and his, his ideas and to be really skeptical of every claim. I think he was great, but he was like a monster and uh, mm. the only legitimate course forward if you want to call yourself a Jeffersonian I think is to acknowledge his, like the terrible failings that you know we would acknowledge now because of like our understanding of the human species and race and justice and freedom like what we take for granted now you got to admit to the fact that it, he, he fell far short from even his ideals and especially our ideals now but that guy was said some insanely revolutionary things that I think we could all applaud it's just he just fell short He's a terrible hypocrite, but we enjoy the benefit of his existence today and maybe take it for granted. Yeah. And I think becoming familiar with him now is excellent. People yeah. should definitely be aware of like his writings and man, he's great, but he was a monster. David Graeber. David Graeber. Um, he's great. Read his books. Read David Graeber. If you don't read David Graeber, you're doing a huge disservice to yourself and to whatever project you got going on. David Graeber has lived in stateless societies. He has studied stateless societies. David Graeber is an activist. He, he not only chronicles exotic societies, which is what anarchists or anthropology. One of the critiques of anarchist or anthropology is that often it's a kind of like colonial project to kind of be a voyeur towards the exotic. Right, you'd be like, ooh, look at these interesting things. And you like almost fetishize different kinds of societies and weird little things that may be interesting. 
But Graeber has a has a wide breadth of work that spans both what might be exotic to the average American or European or Westerner, but then he also has lots of work concerning just us and why those things are meaningful to us. You know, like there's no separation between his his anarchism and his morals and his, his work. He is attempting to make a lot of really interesting anthropological work uh, available to a normal person, and any self-respecting anarchist should. Any person who wants a better society should consult anthropology, but anarchists especially should, without a doubt, consult anarchist anthropologists. And uh, David Graeber is accessible, he is humble, he is interested, he is willing to attempt and fail and critique things that he's interested in and explore things that he's uncomfortable with. His, his work is great and he's indispensable. Anyone, any anarchist or libertarian disregards him at their own cost. From our third interview, here's your favorite free market communist, Frank Miroslav. Nietzsche. Yeah, he's all right. I don't know. Uh, I, think, I think he's like sort of inconsistent and I think he's open to a lot of interpretations, which I think was his point. But um, the German state um, I think was like handing out copies of like Thus Spike Zarathustra to like its soldiers <laughs> in the trenches of World War One, And like, if you've ever read that, it's, you know, very like flowery and sort of complicated, except for like this one chapter where he's like, oh yeah, like the state is like really shitty. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, hilarious. And I don't know, I, I, I had my existentialist phase when I was like, you know, like 16 or something. And I've grown out of it now and I don't know I just I just find it all like a bit like boring and you know it's it's great to like freak out about like meaning and purpose and then once you get older you're like uh oh, you know I, I don't know uh, well no I don't think that's true for everyone but like I I feel much more secure in terms of like life purpose and stuff like that than I did when I was that age so yeah it just doesn't hold as much value for me anymore um which I think Nietzsche was like he was into that sort of thing so yeah he's, he's like fun to quote but yeah, you know, so are a lot of people. <laughs> All right. <laughs> queer theory. I mean, like, basically correct. I haven't, like, read, like, any queer theory, so I, I have no idea. But, you know, like, gender is a spook, and if you would disagree, like, <laughs> you just get wrecked. I think it'd be really interesting to see, like, correlations between, like, conforming to gender roles and, like, intellectual, like, openness and openness to, like, new ideas and, like, trying to be accurate about stuff my like my ultimate dream would you know be to like troll like jordan peterson supporters by being like oh you know like super intelligent ai is like going to be transgender um <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's going to be like a transgender cat girl and it's going to like maximize head pats um <laughs> that'd be that'd be super funny um someone should write that as a short story <laughs> nice okay cool. yeah bernie sanders um, I mean, he like basically revived the left, but I don't know how good of a thing that is. So yeah, I think Bernie Sanders is like, for better or worse, it's like the success of Occupy. I think, I think the fact that, you know, so many millennials are like, oh, you know, socialism, that word is like not scary to me anymore. I think is like the direct result of Occupy. And I think people try and down, downplay it because they don't want the idea that autonomous social groups can achieve things. But I, I think, I think it was pretty effective in that regard. And so they should see Bernie Sanders for better or worse and his popularity as a sign of success. Myers-Briggs. That is dumb. <laughs> I don't like, I don't like personality shit. I, I hate it. I, I, I hate it because like I'm always like, you know, when I feel like shit and I take one of those tests, like, you know, I'm very different from when I, you know, feel all right and I take one of those tests. And so that is yeah. exactly I think, what um, an INTJ would say. Uh, well, I guess I'm <laughs> just kidding. All right, cool. Um, I, I think that means um, from like I was on Reddit once, and I think that means like I'm like a one. I'm like, in like the one percent, and like my average salary is like six figures. Oh um, shit! That's cool. I, I yeah. Um, I think like the big five. That's more accurate. Although even then, dude, like personality is like a spook, and um, yeah, it's it's just like dumb. It's just like shit that people are like. Oh, I'm gonna like optimize my workplace by like getting these people who are like 
good together to do stuff. And like, oh. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm I'm really not a fan. It's like I'm, I'm sure it matters, but I think I think those things are like more variable than people think. And like even if they aren't variable, more variable. Like I I don't want to live in a world where like people have these static personalities. I think this is something that we should act actively fight to like you know people should be able to change. So I I just don't like them. <laughs> Dr. Michael Lawford destroys Luddites with facts and logic. Okay, or I mean, we can even do faster. We can just like do free association. We can do one word for each. I mean, if you want. <laughs> well, you can, you can do it as quickly as you'd like, but feel free to take up to a minute if you want. <clears throat> okay, go ahead. The singularity. Ridiculous. Why? I don't think it's a reality. I think it's the sort of thing that futurists have been saying more or less the same thing for the last 40 years and it's got this very the check is in the mail sort of idea and people who sort of look to the future you've got people who say oh xyz technology is going to save everything and we're all going to live in this utopian dreamland which is you know nothing but orgies and cocaine and then you have people who are like this is going to ruin everything and we're all going to be in this industrial wasteland with nothing and no infrastructure and nobody says you know it might change the flavor of things, but things will probably just continue to medium grade suck indefinitely. Well, damn. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> artificial intelligence. The very exciting thing about artificial intelligence that almost nobody is talking about is the idea of pairing an artificial intelligence with a human operator where the artificial intelligence acts as an enhancement for human intuition rather than a replacement for it. It seems like it's starting to happen in a couple of places, but I think that once people recognize that we're, the goal is not to build an independent operator, but something that can remove certain portions of the workload that are very difficult for humans and not to continuously try and program computers to do the things that are very hard for computers, we'll have some very powerful tools on our hands. The transhumanist party. I'm ready to party. <laughs> what about the transhumanist political party? Oh, well, um, tell them to call me. <laughs> do you think that there's any hope through the electoral process for transhumanism? I don't think there's a lot of hope within the electoral process. Fair enough. Um, <laughs> <laughs> space colonization. Uh, also not very realistic. <laughs> Thinking about the most resource poor environment possible, it's space. Very, very difficult. That said, I did write an article on squatting in disused space vehicles for the Journal of Anarcho-Transhuman. And I do advocate that, but that's not very far away. That's just, you know, in orbit. But colonizing space, um, I think some of it will happen one day. And again, my excitement surrounds people who do this of their own accord without corporate or government support. And in the piece that I wrote, I, I advocate for that pretty strongly. But I think in the way that people think about it, where it's like, oh, America or Elon Musk will take us to Mars or outside the solar system, I, I, I'd say that's a bet against. Vegan, atheist, and anarchist, Christopher Richard Hudson Jr. Kamala Harris. Uh, Kamala Harris is a cop. Explain. I could just like not say anything and run out my one minute clock. Um, <laughs> she thinks she was a prosecutor. I mean, like she she uh, cheered and like brags about putting people in prison. I mean, we have to stop normalizing that. We have to stop pretending like that's okay. We can't. I mean, this needs to become as unacceptable as you know getting the U.S. into war. I mean, mm. not like not like that's unacceptable, but like yeah. we have to start having standards here. I mean, I think it's it's funny that. A lot of the people who had Hillary, you know, 2020 in their bios, like all of them without a doubt that I've seen it are just now 
Paris 2020. Like That's it's just sucks. all the same people, like the white liberals that again, like don't actually care about like liberation or more care about like, I just want like a strong democratic, Democrat like winning the election. And you know, I'm not saying that she's worse than Trump. Like I'm vehemently anti-Trump. I'm not one of those like both sides are bad kind of a thing. That's not what I'm saying. But there actually are alternatives to Kamala Harris running. And so I hope she doesn't win. And I think that if you do support her, you should think critically about supporting people who uh, have the reputation for taking away people's liberty and getting paid for it. Hell yeah. The all meat diet. I honestly don't know how you would survive that. I mean, I would probably just have the shits all day. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I mean, it just seems, it seems health wise, not good. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I mean, ethically, I think it's, but clearly objectionable and uh, unnecessary. Tom Woods. So uh, I had a recent, um, <laughs> an unintentional spat with Tom Woods. He dedicated almost an entire podcast to me, so I'm honored. So it's only fair that I dedicate like a minute to him Damn. on this. Uh, you know, Tom Woods, I think, has done and said some pretty awful things. And, but he's also done and said some really great things, and I think he's a great communicator, which makes me really sad that he, it seems that he's unable to acknowledge where he's wrong. And I know Tom Woods is a smart person. I've listened to Tom Woods before. I don't think he's some kind of opportunist. I mean, I think he's just, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. I would love to have a conversation with Tom Woods and say, like, look, man, I think we got off on the wrong foot. I think that you just are failing to look at this situation through this lens. And I'd like to think that he would be intellectually honest and hear me out and potentially change some of his views. What was the situation that you got in with him? Um, he had, he hosted a podcast with, uh, on his guest, I don't want to say the name, but someone who's like very, like pretty, like knowingly not very sophisticated, basically, saying that discrimination it's sort of like that's this is what's so ridiculous about it like claiming that discrimination is a like not morally wrong like really bad arguments that like discrimination is not morally wrong because like we discriminate all the time when we choose where to live uh or uh -oh. i think i heard the accent you might have you might have let out who he interviewed uh, i don't it's not a very it's not a very famous person so i mean it's you probably it's probably not who you're thinking I would okay hope. okay famous is like out there as unfamous as i think they are but like that plus, so that plus, like, discrimination actually isn't a thing. It's not happening. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of people took that as, like, you're saying those conversations are illegitimate to have. And that wasn't what I was saying, like, when I called that out. What I was trying to say is that those types of things are dog whistles to a specific group of people. Um, it's like talking about, like, black-on-black -black crime. It's like, can you hypothetically think of why that conversation might be like legitimate to have? Yeah, maybe. But that's clearly a dog whistle. Mm. That's clearly a racist dog whistle, especially in the context of North America. Mm. I mean, that's all I was pointing out. And this was this this episode, I don't think this intentionally came out at this time, but it, it, it happened right after the white supremacist mosque shooting. Yeah. And so it was just that podcast came out synonymous, like at the same day as another pod, another like popular libertarian podcast, which was all about black civil rights, mm -hmm. like Malcolm X. It's just telling what these two sides of libertarianism are devoting their platform to. Yeah. And that's all I wanted to bring up because ultimately, like, I wasn't trying to score points. I wasn't trying to get retweets. I was just discouraged. I was discouraged that there are people who identify with the label I care about that don't care about freedom. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. All right. Michel Foucault. Underrated, but <laughs> I probably can't articulate to any intellectual degree why. Okay. So, I mean, I, I yeah, that's really, I think, I think underrated, but I feel like anything more will just, I'll just get hammered by someone, one of my, a lot of our mutual, like, philosophy friends afterwards. <laughs> From the good folks who organized the Please Try This at Home conference, Fox and Sean. All right, xenofeminism. I inhaled the xenofeminist manifesto when it first came out. It was one of the most exciting things I had read in a long time. I have since then reread it several times, shared it with a bunch of people I know, and given it to my girlfriend. So I'm 
yeah, lots of thumbs up on Xeno on Xeno feminism. Richard Stallman. <laughs> okay, so Richard Stallman. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that intellectual property is evil, so I believe like really strongly in free and open source technologies, and I don't think I can like downplay the role that he played in establishing and building that movement. That said, I'm not really into cults of personality myself, and as I understand it, He's a guy that's kind of problematic on a couple different axes. So if we were going to choose a standard bearer for the free and open source technology movement, which I don't think we should, it probably wouldn't be him. All right, Swerfs. I think those people can go to hell. I think both Swerfs and TERFs, which stand for Sex Worker Exclusive Radical Feminists and Trans Exclusive Radical Feminists, are um, extremely polite euphemisms for people who are neither radical nor feminists. I think I certainly think that both gender and sex as an activity are elements that are pretty core to questions of bodily autonomy and people who have an interest in restricting other people's autonomy to make choices about their own bodies regardless of their reasons for doing so are again like we're not on the same side. Yeah, fair enough. Andrew Yang my impression of him from his web presence is that he strikes me as what I think of as a technocrat. To me, a technocrat is somebody who believes that social problems have technological solutions, which is something that like, we fundamentally don't believe. The problems we have in our society, I don't think we have because our technology is inadequate. You know, I believe like we have problems in our society because the institutions of our society like have bad purposes, you know, and technology like enables them to fulfill their bad purposes more efficiently. So I don't think that like uh, better technology is going to fix capitalism or like liberal democracy. Problems of oppression and inequality need to be addressed by restructuring our society, not by like introducing new technologies, you know? Yeah, I think actually Sean put it really succinctly to me the other day that much like art, uh, science follows patronage and the kind of people in our current society who have the resources to be able to patronize science and technology are mostly people who want to do evil, which means that while technology itself is not inherently, despite what prim what primitivists might tell you, technology itself is not tending towards increasing evil, the majority of the technology that's currently being developed is being developed by evil people for evil purposes. Can I say I feel a little bad for picking on the primitivists, <laughs> given that they probably don't listen to podcasts? <laughs> <laughs> They'll never know. <laughs> yeah, and I, also, I, for what it's worth, and I was, you know, I was hanging out at the Big Idea earlier today, and I was talking to somebody who has a lot of primitive -ist friends who don't listen to podcasts about this very issue. But like, I actually think that the perspectives of people who are like radically anti civ are really important to have in this conversation because it's also really important to think about not just what are the liberatory potentials for all of these technologies, but also like, what are the worst case scenarios? Um, what are the, the possible nightmares that we need to be thinking about being prepared to respond to? And I think that people whose response to like, okay, these technologies could have really terrible uh, outcomes, so we should just not invent them. I think that that is a, a naive position about technology. But I also think that thinking about the harm that technology can cause in a much more rigorous way than those of us who are a little more like technophilic. I think the liberatory potential of technology is so vast that it would be, that it's ethically imperative that we develop it. 
But I also think that it's ethically imperative that every time we develop something new, that we ask ourselves the question, what problems does this solution cause? And I am not going to be the best person to answer that question because I'm biased. And I need people on my team and in this conversation with me and with those of us who are like doing the encouraging of that development to be like poking holes in the projects and being like, hey, have you considered this terrible thing that might happen? What are you doing about that? So like, I would really like it if the primitivists would come to the conference, even if just to hang around and tell everybody like all the ways that we're wrong. That was a long one minute response. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Black Mirror. A friend of mine describes Black Mirror as basically boomers overblown fears about technology. It's a pretty um, damn good show though. It's very well produced. Really. And some of the episodes are interesting and fun. And some of them you're like, really? Some of them I, I think like really have pretty keen insights into where we're headed. I forget the no, no stuff. Was that the like social credit rating episode? Um, yeah. That one certainly spoke to me as, like, not an unreasonable possibility. That reminds me of a conversation we had at our first meeting for this incarnation of Please Try This at Home about, like, how many works of dystopian fiction depict worlds that seem to be, like, in many ways better than the one in which we are living. And, like... <laughs> We came to the conclusion that we're living in um, a very boring dystopia. <laughs> and I think maybe a side project of our conference, if we can't get to utopia or even out of dystopia, we can like at least work on creating a more interesting dystopia to exist in. Ted Kaczynski. <laughs> <laughs> so... One of the things that's in the Twitter discourse at the moment is discussion about whether or not prisoners should be allowed to vote. And my favorite tweet that I saw about this was somebody had posted a screen cap from a Fox News broadcast, which had a picture of like, it's an image of, this is a real graphic that is actually airing on Fox News right now. And it says, convicted felons who would be allowed to vote. And then it has, Ted Kaczynski, Scott Peterson, Dennis Rader, the BTK killer, David Berkowitz, the son of Sam, and Terry Nichols. And the caption on this graphic is, these five men are about to change the face of our democracy with five votes in different states. And some anarchist replied, if Ted Kaczynski can run for POTUS, I will vote. Anyway, <laughs> I, I guess the point is that like, yeah, the Fox News commentators were like, oh my God, if felons could vote, then Ted Kaczynski could vote, to which every anarchist is like, like Ted Kaczynski would vote. <laughs> Definitely would not vote for Andrew Young. <laughs> this next one was taken from the eighth episode of the show where we discussed agorism with an old friend of Samuel Edward Conkin III. I present to you, Jack Shimmick. The Black Panther Party. A bunch of guys trying to protect their fellows in their neighborhood who got persecuted by the FBI and... The FBI would kill them or would infiltrate their meetings, try to pit them against each other. Probably, you know, basically good organization. Carl Hess joined the Black Panther Party, even though he was white, because he really believed in what they stood for. I don't have firsthand knowledge. Robert Lefebvre. Uh, he's a great guy. I mean, I met him once. The way a lot of people thought of him was like he was a West Coaster, and the West Coasters were like too laid back for their own good, and they're you know, like easy come, easy go, whereas the East Coast people were like intense intellectuals and, and, you know, did more research. And what I didn't know much about was like kind of right before I got involved in the movement, he had already been doing this thing. I think it was first it was called the Freedom School and later on it was called Ramparts College. And there was some kind of coursework that you could do to learn, learn libertarianism. He was an interesting, charming guy, though, that's for sure. I read recently when it comes to like West Coast versus East Coast politics is like West Coast politics is like if political disagreement occurs, then that's a sign of a bad party. Whereas like East Coast politics is like if you have a party and there isn't a political disagreement, then it's not a good party. <laughs> All right. Pacifism. 
Well, I'm with Konkin on this one. I actually was refreshing myself in the New Libertarian Manifesto, and Konkin said something I thought was just kind of a funny dig, and he was talking about what people would do to defend other people, and he said, by all means, if a pacifist didn't believe in, you know, using guns for self-protection, trust us, we wouldn't, <laughs> we wouldn't rise to their defense, <laughs> or something like that. Konkin was, uh, he said, yeah, you got a right to defend yourself. You have a right to defend your, defend your neighbors or anybody else that's under attack. And, you know, it'd probably be the right thing to do. The legend of Anarcho Claus. Anarcho Claus. Oh, my God. Konkin wrote that. I'll have to go back and reread it again. Um, yeah, he wrote a bunch of funny stuff. It's the third book of the canon. <laughs> <laughs> I think I read it in 1974 and forget it. It was probably forgettable. I don't know. Jahed Momand is an epistemological anarchist who thinks evading the state is good for you. Check out his lightning round. Psychoanalysis. Probably total garbage when it first came about. We should probably pick it up and try to see if we can make any progress with it because the current system completely ne neglects like personal meaning structures at the expense of radically rationalizing everything away with medicine. Racial realism. Oh God, kill it all. Just anyone who has that idea, just get rid of it. <laughs> Ugh, disgusting, turns my stomach. Neo-reactionaries. Oh, neo-reactionaries, God. Well, first, there's like one in a hundred of them are smart and we can learn something from them. They just end up with awful conclusions. Just terrible. Tankies. Oh, yeah. Tankies, my recommendation to you is read Commune Magazine because Commune Magazine seems to be poison pill anarchism for tankies. There's something about horizontalism or mutual aid or uh, anti-authoritarianism sprinkled into every article. I recommend it for you, tankies. It's good medicine. Scientism. Uh, one of the top five or ten greatest evils of our time, uh, as none other than that, I point to things like the ascendance of the intellectual dark web, the inability to destroy Nazism and fascism, uh, and really just the dark side of the Enlightenment, though I kind of hate, kind of, uh, that sounds like I'm saying in saying the dark Enlightenment is good. What I mean is one side of the coin gives us, you know, scientific rationality, the ability to ask questions, models of nature, and, you know, the bridge from natural philosophy. The other side of it justifies things like the scientific classification of all of human activity which is obviously bad the dsm oh it should be abolished total nonsense pseudoscience just a book of fancy rituals that's probably no better than you know like things like the necronomicon agnosticism oh i don't actually have a stance on that one though i am an atheist i guess i don't have any problem with it but uh i guess you don't really you decide not to make any of your own epistemic bets i see and that's fine <laughs> <laughs> Tony Gibson. Oh, Tony Gibson. Gotta respect the, um, I hope I can act like that if conscription or anything like that comes my way. <laughs> but very much respect that guy. Badass. That's the way you goddamn do the fucking lightning round. <laughs> nice. I interviewed a libertarian anarchist who'd rather be picking berries with the boys from the local village where the state is nowhere to be found. Here's Lucy Steigerwald. Private prisons. Oh, they're awful, but a distraction that liberals and leftists are obsessed with because the incentives are perverse. They're also perverse in public prisons to act like they're the problem as opposed to just a part of the big sea of problem is unhelpful. But they're also bad. You know, I don't want to be like, it's like Gary North logic. Oh, but I privatized the bad thing. So it's good now. No. Yeah. No. Tulsi Gabbard. Um, I have to get even more into her background. I, I definitely like to see her playing some of the Ron Paul-ish cards in terms of non-interventionism. And some people think she's hot, so she'd be our first hot president, and that would be great. Um, <laughs> she's, she's major problems with her, but obviously she's better on some very important things, which is why I assume she will fail. <laughs> yeah, reasonable gun control. I know that reasonable is a term that legal logic uses a lot. Like, what would a reasonable person do? But I don't, I don't want that because no, thank you. <laughs> Taylor Swift. Kind of turned into the only pop person I like. My inroad to her was like the song Mean, where I was like, oh, this isn't real country. I wouldn't want to listen to this over and over again. And I was like, hmm, 
maybe I do. I think she's actually really talented, um, and I think that some of her early songs make that pretty obvious, but not everyone's cup of tea, of course, and that's, that's fine. <laughs> From the 11th episode of the show, professor, author, philosopher, musician, critic of Bob Dylan and Joe Biden, I give you Crispin Sartwell. Victim. I was born for this man. Awesome. <laughs> Wittgenstein. <laughs> I've written two pieces lately on how Wittgenstein is terribly overrated. I had professors in grad school for whom the only question, the questions, what is true and what did Wittgenstein really mean, were the same question. <laughs> All right. And, and man, I, I think he's an obscurantist. I think he's really trying to project the personality of a genius mm -hmm. in a way, like it's a persona. On the other hand, though, there, there's some pretty great ideas there, like family resemblance and anyway, is that a minute? Yeah, that's good, that's good. Yeah, amazingly overrated. Okay. Yeah. Wu-Tang Clan. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, those were great records, okay? Like, I, I love that stuff in the early 90s, man. Like, those were just great records. And I, I love the sound. I love where rap and New York rap went at that moment. I mean, I, I respect Public Enemy, but I wouldn't, like, put the records on over and over again, you know? Mm. Like, it's really harsh. It's, like, really, like, it, it almost hurts to listen to. Mm -hmm. And it should, right? Like, they want it to. Mm -hmm. But, man, like, I took Wu-Tang and maybe also the L.A. stuff, you know, uh, Snoop and Dre as such a relief from that you know but I love those early Wu-Tang records and the solo records by you know RZA and all that stuff too cool <laughs> the Mises Institute <laughs> man I don't know nothing about the Mises Institute <laughs> I'm gonna leave it at that I don't know all right Taoism Oh man, it's been central to my life in a lot of ways. Like I, I teach it, you know, I teach Chinese philosophy. Again, that's problematic for somebody like me. I got sober in AA in 91 or 90 in Nashville and I needed a higher power and it wasn't gonna be the Christian God at that point at all. And I called it the Tao and I drenched myself in Taoism. And I, I love the Tao Te Ching. I love, I'm gonna teach it again this year. I love Zhuangzi very much. And for a long time, I kind of identified as a Taoist. I've translated the Tao Te Ching myself with, with help. And um, yeah, it's one of the central texts in my mind. And I also think it's an anarchist political text as well right youth liberation youth liberation well one thing I, i'm an opponent of compulsory education basically i mean like this is not a, uh, a popular position to take up but i experienced it as an unbelievably oppressive like i experienced going to public school as you know living in an eastern european dictatorship or whatever it's like living in romania under ceausescu we're watching you all the time we're going to tell you how to dress you know, we're gonna ring little bells and then your little body has to do exactly what you know, we say. It made me, well, maybe violently rebellious. <laughs> and yeah, I think this is really, really important. And I think we are surrounding our kids more and more with just like structures of authority that go down to their every decision, their every moment and stuff like this. And I just want, I just wish kids could play, man. Yeah, yeah, I feel that, that's beautiful. All right, last one. All right. Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you can check me out on YouTube and columns on this one, too. I think he's an idiot, dude. Okay, so, you know, the next debate is tomorrow night. Oh, God, don't remind me. Yeah, well, I mean, if, you, if you're watching, really listen to each sentence that comes out of Joe Biden's mouth and see whether it makes sense or whether it really says what you suspect he intends to say. <laughs> because it does not. Uh, I mean, you know, I guess what I did in a couple columns and, and also on YouTube is just cut and paste from the transcript of the last debate or a couple of interviews with Biden. And it's just nonsense. Now, I do have reservations that a lot of people have about, like, say, the crime bill or the or the kind of like sort of Clinton style Democrat who I think really prosecuted a racist agenda throughout most of my life. But it was just kind of like slightly disguised. You know what I mean? It, it doesn't count if it's a Democrat as far as I'm concerned. 
<laughs> yeah, okay, good. That's good. Yeah, but so I'm not a big fan of, of Joe Biden, and I wasn't a big fan of Hillary Clinton along these lines either. Last but certainly not least, the anarchist without adjectives that everyone loves to quote, and someone we all owe a great deal of gratitude toward, Kevin Carson. Marx. Well, I'm, I'm not a Marxist, obviously. I don't believe in his philosophy of historical materialism. I think if you take it to a self-parody level, it's just vulgar Marxism. But given capitalism as a system with a beginning and end, I think his dialectical analysis of its internal functioning is very useful. And a lot of his followers, like the autonomists, I find very useful as well. Mises. I'm generally hostile towards him, uh, based to a large extent on my interaction with Austrian types online. I think a lot of his historical analysis is incredibly vulgar and right-wing. There, there are some aspects of his a prioriism I find useful, although I have trouble admitting it. Electoral politics. I see uh, electoral politics as useful as a sideline, but I'm really sympathetic to the idea of voting for the lesser evil because I see it as just a way to, as something to throw into the breach and stave off the worst of the fascist onslaught and, and buy time for the stuff that's really important, like the institutions we're building on the ground. I don't, I don't see electoral politics as a way to get the best possible people in to, as you know, the main way to implement your agenda. I have much more limited view of what it's for, so I don't get that upset at the idea of compromising or choosing a lesser evil. Insurrection. I see insurrection largely as irrelevant given the possibilities of interstitial development and, and building the commons right now. There may be violence involved in the transition period. There may be some violent rupture, but if so, it'll just be... Uh, something that's probably initiated by the state and uh, the outcome will just be to ratify all the changes that have been going on interstitially on the ground for the previous couple of generations. Exodus. Well, Exodus is uh, the title of the book I'm working on right now and it's uh, what I see as the primary approach to post-capitalist transition, an exodus into the commons and into a commons-based counter-economy, a, a commons-based post-capitalist economy developing within the interstices of, of this one and coalescing into a parallel system that will eventually supplant it. The abolition of work. Uh, I'm generally uh, sympathetic to it. I don't like the direction that left accelerationist types have taken it in, uh, and I don't see it as something that'll be accomplished, uh, you know, on a monolithic level by any kind of technological engineering, but I see it as a gradual process of withdrawal from the cash nexus and production gradually becoming more integrated into social activity and play. There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed the lightning round compilation of 2019. If you like any single one of the guests that we had on last year, consider supporting them in whatever way you can, be it financial or otherwise. And of course, if you're a fan of non-servium, please consider doing the same for us. Go to patreon.com slash non media to chip in. We've got some big and interesting things in store, and we could use your support now more than ever. Once again, this is a labor of love, and we appreciate everyone who donates financially, or simply likes and shares our content. Thank y'all for helping liberatory ideas reach a larger audience. And of course, thank y'all so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.